Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Today we began talking about the third of the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, these are all of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there's no law. Nothing can come against it successfully when you walk in these ways. We talked about love. We talked about joy. And this morning we talked about how you must be having the peace of God in your life. It is a spiritual peace that comes from Him through the Word of God. And we talked about many things, and we started out mentioning the fact that grace and peace is given 13 times in, in the greetings to the churches, and we also see that grace, mercy, and peace is given four times, and mercy and peace is given one time. And we saw that in each one of these cases, when they gave them, you look at the verse before, we see conditions that are important to be met. And tonight we're going to talk about the how we actually obtain the peace of God manifest in our life on a continual basis. First of all, let's cover a couple of those things that we mentioned this morning. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3 is one of the examples. Grace unto you, the B is not there in the Greek, it literally says grace unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, verse 2 goes back and tells you what causes that to happen for someone. It's not automatic. He says in verse 2, Under the church of God is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Well, when it talks about them being sanctified, that means a work has been done in their life. Be, become holy. Be those who are separate from the things that are not of God. Be cleansed. Come to the place of walking in His ways. If you're here for the first time, we explain all this, but we bring up a lot of important information about tense voice mood, about the verbs, which is essential to understand what's being said. This is a perfect tense verb. The perfect tense in the Greek denotes completed action in the past with present results at the time of speaking. In other words, this is saying to them that have been sanctified in the past with present results at the time of speaking, meaning a work has been done in their life. And it obviously has been done such that they've been walking in it, that they're walking as one who is separate, sanctified, holy, dedicated unto the Lord. Called saints, not called to be. The word to be, notice it's italicized. It's not in the Greek. It's been added by the translators. It literally says called saints. What are the saints? the holy ones, those who have come holy. With all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, our, our, Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. This shows you that conditions to see God's grace and peace come to you is because of the fact that you have been sanctified and you are a holy one before God and you have a, certainly a relationship with Him and the fact that you're calling upon His name. You're walking in His ways. God wants us to understand there's conditions for all these things to come to pass. They aren't automatic. It's not whatever God chooses. It all depends on whether we meet the conditions. We've talked about that on the series on grace. There are conditions for the grace of God as well as the mercy of God, as well as the area of, when we talk about um, the peace of God coming to pass. God wants us to understand. We'll look at one of the other scriptures over here in Titus. We looked at several this morning. But Titus, chapter 1, as we begin in verse 1, he says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the precise correct knowledge, the precise correct knowledge, because this is a noun in the Greek, of the truth which is after godliness. Otherwise, we've got to get the precise correct knowledge of God by studying the Word, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began, and hath in due times manifested His word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. And then he says to Titus, this one who has received the knowledge of God, and he makes a comment about him. 
He says, mine own son. This particular word own is not the word for own in the Greek. This is a particular word which means true and genuine and sincere. One who is the real deal. He's one who is true, genuine, sincere after the common faith. That's what you and I must be. God's grace and mercy and peace is not just going to come for anybody just because they've been born again and they just walk in whatever way they want to. It's for those who are truly genuine, following the way of the Lord. When you meet the conditions, God is going to bring forth his promises in our life. One other one that we looked at is over in 2 John that we want to look at again. He says, elder unto the elect, or the chosen lady, and her children, lady actually is a name of a Christian woman, Kuria, and her children, whom I am loving in the truth. Why? Because they were walking in the truth. This is a present tense verb. I am loving in the truth. And not only I, but all they that have known the truth. Because what were they walking after? The truth. That's what we must be doers of the word and walk in the truth. When he says that they have known the truth, again, this is this perfect tense verb, meaning they have known it in the past and has present effects in their life because, obviously, they're hearers and doers of it. They're continuing it. They're walking in the truth. That is what God wants for you and me. And for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and why is it dwelling and remaining in them, as it says? It's because they're doing the word. As you hear and do the word, then the truth will remain in you, and it says it shall be with us forever, or to the age. And to those ones, he says, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Walking in truth, being holy before the Lord, being those who are sanctified and set apart unto Him, those ones who are getting the precise, correct knowledge of God and being a doer of the Word, these things are essential if you are going to see God's promises and His blessings come to pass in your life. Now we talked about the word in the Old Testament, which we'll look at, about peace, is the word shalom. And we see, as we begin to look at what's going to be necessary to obtain peace, we look here in Leviticus chapter 26, in verse 3. If you walk in my statutes, that's the condition, keep my commandments, we're under the New Testament, we keep the commandments of Jesus Christ, and do them. Be a doer of his word. Then, he talks about all these blessings. Otherwise, there's conditions for all these things. Then I will give you rain in due season. The land shall yield or increase. The trees of the field, which you and I are a type of, or the trees of righteousness, shall yield their fruit, fruits of righteousness. Your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. God will protect us. I'll give peace in the land. This is the word shalom. It doesn't talk just about peace of mind. This is a particular word that refers to the total work of God in your life. Completeness, soundness, welfare. It also refers to health, prosperity, contentment, tranquility, quiet, rest, all these things. It really is the manifestation of covenant relationship in your life. That's what he'll bring forth in you, if you will walk in his ways and meet the conditions. And you'll lie down and none shall make you afraid. And no, you'll rid evil beasts out of the land, type of getting rid of all the evil spirits we cast out of us. Neither shall the sword go through your land. That means there's not going to be any destruction anymore. You're going to have spiritual rest and victory over your enemies. He goes on and says, what you're going to have to do, though, you must engage in warfare. He said, you shall chase your enemies. The word chase is a word, radof, which means normally to pursue. Translated pursue many times throughout the Old Testament. You're going to pursue your enemies. And what are we going to do? We're going to destroy them. Well, how do we do that in the New Testament? We cast them out of every area of our life. Notice, they shall fall before you by the sword. What is the spiritual sword in the New Testament? It is the rhema spoken word, or that which is spoken out of our mouth. Otherwise, you war with your mouth. 
You command the evil spirits to come out. You speak to mountains to be removed. You speak forth with your mouth to release your faith and release the power of God. And you use it as a sword to smite the enemies for them to be put underfoot. They're going to fall before you by the sword. And there aren't just a few of them. There's a lot of them. Five of you will chase a hundred. A hundred of you will put 10,000 to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Our enemies are spiritual enemies, remember, not people. Evil spirits that you and I go after, you have to understand, you have to look at all the Old Testament things in the light of spiritual realities. They're types and shadows of the spiritual realities as we understand them applicable for us today. Then he says, for I'll have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. God has brought you and I into a covenant relationship. If we'll walk in his ways, if we'll keep his commandments, if we'll do his word consistently, then all these blessings are going to come upon us. And his peace, this covenant of peace, will be manifested in our life. At the same time, you have to engage in warfare, drive out all the enemies, and as God will have respect unto you then. And the result of the word in your life and eliminating the enemies is you will be fruitful, multiplied, and the covenant will be established with you in your life. So the first thing we see, we've got to put the word first place. We've got to be doers of the word. We've got to be keeping the commandments of the Lord. People who just want to cast out the demons but not do the word and correct the problems in their life and go forth and bring forth fruit, they never get anywhere. Because you've got to be not only driving the enemies out, but also hearing and doing the word, bringing forth fruit, correcting every problem in your life, and seeing the Lord accomplish the establishment of his covenant with you to make you fruitful and multiply you. That's what he wants to do in your life, and that is what he will accomplish. Another thing we see in line with this, we see it over in 1 Samuel chapter 7, a scripture we were looking at at the end of the, this morning's time. 1 Samuel 7, 13, he says, So the Philistines were subdued. The Philistines were the enemies, and they are a type of the evil spirits, they were all, they're on enemy constantly. Well, they have to be subdued. They have to be put underfoot. And they came no more into the coast of Israel. Well, if they came no more, that means you're going to have spiritual rest. They're going to be eliminated from your life. You're going to be free and walk in victory. And you can come to that place. The hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Well, God will be against all, of our, all the evil spirits that we cast out as long as we don't give place to them and walk in sin. Now, if you walk in sin, guess what? They're coming back in. And they'll come back with seven more wicked than themselves, and you'll be in worse to shape. That's why we got to correct every problem area in our life and make sure we're hearing and doing the word. The cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored. God not only delivers you from this, he brings restoration to you. He'll restore your soul. He'll restore all the things that the enemy has stolen from you. And he goes on and says, The coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of listings. We'll get delivered. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. When you do what God says, which is to pursue your enemies and drive them out, he will bring you to the place where those enemies won't bother you anymore. You can cast them out, see them be put underfoot, and as you guard yourself and walk in the ways of the Lord, you are going to see the manifestation of the covenant of peace, safety, protection, prosperity, healing, deliverance, all the promises that he wants to bring forth in your life, and he will absolutely do it. We see over in Psalms, God wants us to operate in peace at all times relationships or whatever it might be even. We should not allow ourselves to get into strife, arguments, have bitterness, resentment, anger, all these kind of things. Look what it says in Psalms 34, 14. Depart from evil and do good. That means we, got, we can't continue in evil and think we're going to get the blessings of God. You've got to depart from it and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. You're going to run after it to seek, see it come to pass in your life. You're going to seek after it. It's not just going to fall on you out of nowhere. You're going to seek it because you're going to walk in line with the Word. You're going to meet the conditions to see God bring it to pass. And certainly you've got to depart from evil and do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord. In Psalms 37, 
Verse 11. The meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. We saw this scripture this morning. We want to bring it up again. The word meek refers to those who are humble. The humble, lowly one who is submitted unto God. Every one of us, we have to be humble. We cannot have any pride. We cannot have any selfishness. We cannot be living unto ourself. Who are the ones who are going to inherit the earth and see the abundance of peace? It's those who are humble before the Lord. If you're humble before the Lord, you're submitted unto Him, you're yielded to Him, you're going to be obedient to do with the things He tells you to do, you are going to see the possession of your inheritance as well as the abundance of peace and all of His great blessings that He will bring forth. We look in verse 37. Mark the perfect man. God is taking us on into perfection. As the foundation is laid in your life, He says, let us go on to perfection. And we see the fact that through, as we walk in line with his word, we come to the perfect man. Mark the perfect man. And behold the upright. Well, that's the one who's upright in heart. We must go on to perfection and come to the place of being upright in heart. For the end of that man is peace. Completeness, soundness, wholeness, total victory, prosperity, blessing. God wants to bless every single one of us. He wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can even ask or think if we'll just do what he says. But he talks about the perfect man and the upright one. That is the one who's going to see these things happen. Psalms 55, verse 16. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. He's got to be your source. You're not going to try to figure things out and do things in your own strength. God's the one who will deliver you and save you. You call on him. Evening, morning, and noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Consistent prayer throughout the day, consistent prayer day after day, because prayer releases the ability of God, puts him in operation, takes hold of promises. Wars a good warfare against the enemy as you pray prayers of authority. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. There will be a battle against you. And your God will deliver you from that as you fight that good fight of faith and you war a good warfare. Notice, for there were many with me. Who are the ones that are with you? It's the angels. The angels are ministering spirits that are sent forth to minister for us, the heirs of salvation. And what, are they, what do they do? Do they automatically minister for us? No. They do His commandments. They perform His Word. They carry out the things of the Word of God. And they hearken to the voice of the Word and who's doing the speaking of the word? You and I are, and Jesus takes it, confesses it before the angels that go forth to accomplish it. Otherwise, you're going to engage in warfare, and the angels are going to go into operation to, in the realm of the Spirit. The battle's the Lord's, the victory's ours. They will fight against them, and they'll deliver your soul in peace from that battle that was against you, because there's many with you. Praise God. God will hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old. Then he goes and makes a statement, though. He says, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. If you don't change areas in your life where they haven't been right, you're not going to get any victory, for one. And it also shows we don't fear God. Because the fear of God will cause us to deal with all the problems in our life, to depart from iniquity, to like greatly in His commandments. The fear of God is to hate evil. And when you hate it, you will turn away from it. All areas of sin have to be conquered in our life. And evidence that you have the fear of God is the change will come forth because God will do this. Because remember, we're being changed and transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ as you do what His Word says. Well, we're going to have to walk in righteousness if we're going to see God accomplish what He purposes. Psalm 72, verse 7. In His days shall the righteous flourish an abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. Who are the righteous? Many people have thought the righteous is just in this day and hour, just those who are born again, and that that includes every Christian. Not so. That is one aspect of righteousness, but there's more to righteousness than just being born again and getting a brand new spirit. How do we know? Because of what the Word says. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, Look what he says. Little children, let no man deceive you. 
why would God be having something here about warning us not to be deceived? Because the subject that he is addressing in his foreknowledge, he understands the fact that uh, there is an accurate teaching about this. The teaching has been wrong. Look what he says. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. This isn't about just getting born again. This is doing righteousness. What is the righteousness? The word of righteousness. And when he talks about doing righteousness, this is a present tense, which means in the Greek, ongoing, continuous action. He is continually doing righteousness. That's essential. You must continually be doing the word of God and bring forth fruits of righteousness to be shown to be righteous before him. Those are the ones that are going to flourish. Those are the ones that are going to have the abundance of peace. So we see another thing that's necessary to obtain peace is being a doer of the word of righteousness consistently in your life. That is of utmost importance. And we must put the word first place. In Psalms 119. Psalms 119. We pick up in verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law. If you love the word of God, then you're going to be hearing it and doing it and carrying it out in your life. Notice even what it says about the person who's loving the law. Nothing shall offend them. The word offend actually means to cause you to stumble. Nothing will cause you to stumble or any, any means of stumbling whatsoever because you're going to walk in the Word of God. Nothing will cause you to stumble if you put God's Word first place. And remember, sin has no dominion over you. You can conquer all sin in your life. God wants you to realize you're dead to sin, but you're alive unto God. And now you can walk in the way of righteousness and bring forth the fruits of righteousness. And righteousness is tied in with peace, always. We see it many different times. Here's one of the scriptures that we looked at also this morning that's important. Psalms 85, verse 10. Righteousness and truth are met together. Excuse me, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That means well, they, they are combined. You know, when righteousness is happening, then the peace is going to happen. The peace of God will be manifest. So God wants us to make sure we're walking in line with the ways of righteousness. That is absolutely essential. And that means we need to be a doer of the word. For those who are going to obtain the peace of God and all that the peace is about, we're going to have to put the word first place. Look what it says in Proverbs 3, verse 1 and 2. My son, forget not my law. Why would you forget the law? What's it say in the New Testament? If you're a doer of the word and not a hearer only, then you're going to walk in the way of the word. But how, how about if you're just a hearer only? You're a forgetful hearer. The guy who forgets the, the word of God is the one who doesn't do it. Let thine heart keep my commandments. God wants you to get the word in your heart, hear and do it, and have it incorporated into your lifestyle. So this is the way you live. This is the way you think. This is what you speak. This is what you do all the time. It's not like, you. oh, I've got to get God to do something for me for a moment's time, and the rest of the time you run around in the flesh or walk after sin or do whatever you want to do. That's not going to get it. Sin is, dwell, sin is dwelling in the flesh, and you walk in the flesh, you're going to give place to the enemy, and those evil spirits are going to come in, and you're, he's going to destroy you in all kinds of areas of your life. We cannot forget his word. The key is doing it and become part of your lifestyle. You won't forget it. It's incorporated into the way you function. And let your heart keep the commandments. Remember, we've got to guard our heart, because who's coming to try to take the word out? The devil. How can he take the word out? if you don't keep the word. That's why you've got to keep the commandments of God before you at all times. Well, look at the promise for those ones who don't forget the word, they're doers of it, and they keep the commandments of God. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to you. You're going to have length of days, long life, and completeness, soundness, welfare, health, prosperity, safety, protection, that's what God will bring forth for you in your life. He will manifest His great peace for you. At the same time, as we hear and do the Word, we see something further in this chapter. 
Verse 13, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. Not only do we get knowledge, but we need to get understanding and wisdom. Knowledge comes to us, it's pleasant to our souls, the word says. Then as you do the word, understanding, which is revealed to us and, and imparted to us because we're walking in line with the word, it'll come forth in our life. And as we walk after the knowledge and understanding, we'll get wisdom, knowing what to do in every situation. He goes on and says, For the merchandise is better than silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. We need to get this. She's more precious than rubies and all things that can't desire are not to be compared to her. He wants you to get understanding and get wisdom. Length of days in her right hand and her left hand riches and honor. What's going to be the blessing for you getting understanding and wisdom? Long life, riches, and honor from the Lord. See, God wants to bless you, but you've got to meet the conditions. And it's all going to be because of the performance of His covenant the covenant of peace, as we talked about this morning, gave five scriptures on that. The covenant of peace that he wants to manifest for you. Another thing that we see, one more verse here, he says, Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all our paths are peace. Well, that's what's going to happen. You're going to have length of days. You're going to have riches and honor. Your ways are going to be ways that are going to be of pleasantness, and the paths are going to be of peace. That means God's blessings are going to be coming upon you as you are walking in the way of the Lord. He'll bring forth what He purposed. Remember the angels that go before you, prepare the way, bring you to the place that God's prepared for you, and bring forth the great blessings. Proverbs 16 is an important scripture as far as seeing the peace of God manifest. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That means... The enemies aren't even going to be able to get to you if the man's ways please the Lord. Remember, when you're walking the Lord, you can walk in the ways of the Lord, you can come to the place where the enemy can't even touch you. He can't even get to you as you walk uprightly before him. If your ways will please the Lord, the enemies will be at peace with you. You will be protected from the enemies. God wants us, of course, to please the Lord. How does our ways please the Lord? When you're hearing and doing the word. That's how you're going to obtain this peace that God has for you, which includes protection and deliverance and rest from your enemies, as we see here. Another thing that we see in Proverbs 17, Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. God wants you to have quietness. He wants you to have that which is peace and ease blessing in your life. We can't be involved in anything that causes strife. Strife, arguments, contention, it's not of the Lord. He doesn't want that to happen in any of our lives. That takes away your peace. That's sin. That gives place to the enemy in your life. No strife should be happening. That's why we've got to put the word first place. And you're going to put the word first place in your household, in your own life, whatever you do. And you're not going to compromise it. And you're also not going to get in strife with other people. Do not let yourself. The servant of the Lord must not strive, the Bible says. Instead, with meekness, we instruct those that are opposing themselves with the word of God so they can have a chance to come to repentance and recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Now, if you're going to see the peace of God manifest, you're going to have to really govern the area of your mind. Over here in Isaiah 26, Verse 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Another thing that's essential is where your mindset. Your mind needs to be thinking on what God wants. You can't give place to the devil in your mind, bringing all kinds of negative thoughts. If those thoughts come in your mind, you're to cast them down. You're to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Your mind's to be stayed on Him. And notice, that shows that you're trusting in Him. And what's the result? He'll keep you in perfect peace. If you don't learn to govern your mind with the Word of God, you won't have peace in your mind. You won't have peace within you. And also, you won't be seeing God's blessings coming forth in your life because you'll keep giving place to the enemy in your mind continually. And remember, that's one of the gates into your heart. God's looking upon your heart. 
We see down in verse 12. Lord, wilt thou ordain or appoint peace for us? For thou hast wrought all our works in us. How are we going to come to this place of this appointed peace? Because God's work has been done in you. For thou hast wrought or work made all our works in us. God's the one who does this great work in you. And how does he do it? Through the word in you. And what is our responsibility? To be a doer of the word. That's why you and I are responsible to work out our own salvation. We saw this scripture even this morning, but bears looking at it again. Philippians 2.12 Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out, perform, accomplish your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's by you doing what the Word says. Because notice what he says, as we've always obeyed. You want to see God's covenant of peace and prosperity and blessing and riches and honor and all the things we've already seen come to pass? We must come to the place of being obedient. Always obeying. Working out your own salvation. Performing and accomplishing it. And this is going to be an ongoing work because it is a present tense verb. Continuously working out your own salvation. At the same time, this isn't a nice suggestion, good idea. It's actually a command from God because it's an imperative mood verb. He's commanding you and me to continually be working out our own salvation. Now you say, what do you mean? I, I didn't think I could do it myself. You can't do anything yourself. But you have a part to play, which is doing the word, obedience to the word. And what happens when you do the word? I'll read on to the next verse. For it is God which is working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. When you're obeying his word, you're putting God in operation. How does he accomplish everything in your life? Through the word of God that you're hearing and doing as you do it. He is working within you to accomplish everything. That's why working out your own salvation, putting the word of God first place is absolutely essential. We go back to Isaiah. God wants you to enter into all that he has for you. Isaiah chapter 32. We pick up in verse 15. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. Well, that's, that's growing up and becoming a tremendously blessed place. Not a wilderness anymore. A fruitful field, and then it comes to the place of being a forest. Look what he says. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness. Are we supposed to be in the wilderness? where there's no fruit and no good things happening? No, they died out in the wilderness. We're supposed to go in and possess the land, right? And righteousness remains in the fruitful field. In other words, if you're dwelling in the wilderness, you're going to see judgments. But if you are in the fruitful field because of doing the word of righteousness, and you have the fruits of righteousness, you're going to see God's blessing. And what will this work of righteousness accomplish? The work of righteousness shall be peace. See, righteousness is tied into the manifestation of shalom, of the completeness, of the soundness, of the welfare, of the health, the prosperity. It's all tied into it. That's why the work of righteousness must be accomplished in you through the Word. And the effect of righteousness, what's it produce? Quietness and assurance forever, because your enemies will be at peace you'll, with you. You'll be at rest You'll come to the place, this is a word which really means to be at the place of rest, undisturbed, be quiet. You know, you're not going to have any attacks coming against you anymore. And you see that in the Old Testament. The ones who obeyed and did what God said, they had rest. They had rest for a long time until they got in sin again, started giving place to the enemies and allowed them to come in and bring destruction. My, my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, that's where God wants to bring you to. He wants to bring you to a peaceable habitation, a peaceable abode. You are abiding in all these things, in the work of God in your life, in insured dwellings, and in quiet, resting places. That means God doesn't want you in turmoil. He doesn't want you in anxiety. He doesn't want you in all, all this negativism. No, that's the work of the devil. He wants to bring you to the place of having peace, being at rest, 
having conquered your enemies. And it's all the result, remember, of the work of righteousness. And, of course, what does that mean? Remember, what does it happen when you obey? It produces the fruits of righteousness, as we see. Remember, righteousness remains in the fruitful field. You're to become a fruitful field. God wants you to go from fruit, go through the cleansing process to more fruit, and come to the abiding place of much fruit. They're the real disciples. That's what he wants to accomplish for you in your life. But this means we've got to put the word first place. Because if you're going to see God's peace, walking in the word is essential. Many Christians today don't know the word because they haven't studied the word. They haven't spent the time in the word. They haven't got their priorities in line. Many times they think they're too busy for it. No, you need to set your priorities that you learn the word, you know the word, and you walk in it. Look what it says. He's speaking here in Isaiah 48, 18. He's lamenting because they didn't do this. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. If you had just done the commandments that I told you to do, then had thy peace been as a river. A river just flows, doesn't it, continually. The peace, the completeness, the wholeness, the prosperity, the safety, the protection, those, all those things will just flow continually in your life. And thy righteousness, which produces fruits of righteousness, as the waves of the sea. Fruits keep coming, wave after wave after wave. This is what God will have, bring forth. But what's the key? You've got to hearken to his commandments. You can't do what you want to do. Remember, you're bought with a price. You're a purchased possession. You belong to him. You're not your own. If you're walking after your own way, you're walking in the flesh. But if you don't live to, him, you don't live to yourself any longer, we live unto him. How do we live unto him? Put his word first place in all that you do, and then you're going to have peace like a river, and the righteousness is the waves of the sea. So everything we do, God wants you to have peace. And he also, as we talked about previously, he wants you to have joy. Look what it says. We'll go back to verse 11 of Isaiah 55. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Well, it's being sent into your heart and mine. It's also being sent out when you speak it or do it and send it forth to accomplish the things that he purposes. And so, as you get the word in you and you're going to go forth, what are you going to do? You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. He wants you to have joy. Where does joy come from? The word as well. We talked about that before. We'll come back to this in a moment. But we, for those who didn't hear that message, the way you get joy, it has nothing to do with your circumstances. It has to do with the word in you. Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found. Well, why would that be? Because you were seeking after them. You seek, you find. And I did eat them. Well, that meant I took them inside of me. I digested them. They became a part of my life. And the word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. God's word in you will produce joy, not circumstances. Happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is based on God's word in you. If you have the joy of the Lord in you, then you're going to have, that's because you have the word in you, in your life. Back to Isaiah 55, 12. You'll go out with joy, you'll be led forth with peace. That's what he wants. You shouldn't be doing, th you shouldn't, you, you should, your life should be just continually having joy and having peace in whatever you do. Mountains and hills will break forth before you into singing, all the trees of fields will clap their hands. You're going to go forth with the joy of the Lord and the peace of God, and you are going to see God lead you, guide you, accomplish everything, because you're walking in line with the Word of God. Great things will happen. Now, if you're going to walk in His ways, which we are expected to do, Malachi chapter 2, we pick up over in verse 5. Notice what he says. My covenant was with him of life and peace. God's covenant is of his life and peace for us. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. He had the fear of the Lord before him. And he was afraid before my name. That means the guy who got the covenant of life and peace was walking in the fear of the Lord. 
We're told to walk in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Fear God and keep His commandments, the conclusion of the whole matter. The fear of God is understanding the fact that His way is right, and if you walk in His ways, of course, blessings will come, but if you don't walk in His ways, what's going to happen? Curses are going to come. You're going to give place to the enemy, and he's not going to be able to defend you against the enemy because you opened the door. We walk in the fear of the Lord by being obedient to his word, and we hate evil, and we delight greatly in his commandments. What else? The law of truth was in his mouth. God wants the word in your mouth. You speak truth. Iniquity was not found in his lips. That means he's not speaking things that are sinful. He's not speaking things that are contrary to the way of righteousness. He walked with me in peace and equity. This means uprightness. That's how you walk with the Lord. You walk with Him in peace and uprightness. And did turn many away from iniquity. Because you're going to be a witness wherever you go. You're going to stand up for righteousness. You're going to show it forth. You're not going to be a compromiser. And you're going to turn away many from iniquity, so they'll turn to the Lord as you are a witness for Him and walking in the ways of the Lord. That is what He wants. Now, another thing that we see over in Ezekiel, chapter 34. Here it speaks again about this covenant of peace. We pick up down in verse 23. I'll set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. You need to get fed by the shepherd who is Jesus, who is bringing the word. Those people that in the New Testament that are called, that have ministry gifts, they are under shepherds. They're under the lordship of Jesus, and they're to be bringing forth the word of God and feeding the word of God to you. That's my responsibility. I and the Lord will be their God, my servant David, a prince among them, and I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I'll make with them a covenant of peace. And I'll cause the evil beast to cease out of the land. Well, that's a type of the evil spirits being eliminated. They'll dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I'll make them and the places round about my hill a blessing, and will cause the shower to come down in his season. There'll be showers of blessings. For those who are walking in the way of the word, showers of blessings are supposed to come upon you. That's not a little trickle once in a while. That's not saying, well, well, you know, I don't see any showers of blessings. Well, that's what's supposed to happen. That's the covenant of peace. If you meet the conditions, God wants you blessed coming in and going out. He wants you blessed in all the work of your hands. He wants to bring forth showers of blessings upon you. And that is because of the fact that you follow His ways. The trees of the field, that's what you and I shall yield her fruit. How does fruit come forth? Well, because of the seed that's going to grow up and produce that. What's the seed? The Word in our life. What's it need to do? It needs to grow and develop and produce fruit in you. The earth shall yield or increase. They'll be safe in their land. They'll know that I am the Lord. That speaks of your, His protection and safety. And also knowing that He's the Lord, you develop a personal, intimate fellowship with Him. It's not just trying to possess a promise or possess something or get free of a problem in my life. It's coming into a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord to know Him. They'll know that I am the Lord. When I've broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them, God will deliver you out of everything. And you'll be no more a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beasts of the land devour them, but they'll dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. No more devouring. You see that? all over the Word of God. You say, well, I've been devoured a lot. Well, God wants to deliver you and set you free and turn that all around. Jesus Christ wants to manifest Himself mightily in your life to deliver you from everything and bring the covenant of peace and blessing and prosperity and health and safety and protection, all the things that He has, into manifestation in your life. Chapter 37, this is a couple of scriptures that we did look at this morning, but they're certainly important to realize what they're saying. Moreover, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. It'll be an everlasting covenant with them. And I'll place them, multiply them, I'll set my sanctuary in the midst of them. Well, that's God inhabiting you, His sanctuary, the manifestation of His presence. Why would God manifest His presence in you? <laughs> because you're a doer of the Word. You're walking in His ways. 
if you walk in His ways and keep His commandments, then He will manifest Himself in the midst of you. My tabernacle also shall be with them, yea, I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. The heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. In other words, the sanctification process gets accomplished in you to bring you to the place of being holy. Remember, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And holiness is what you and I are commanded. He said, be holy as I am holy. We are commanded to be holy, and who's going to bring us to that place? The Lord will. How is it produced? Because of fruits of righteousness that produces holiness in your life. As you do the word and you are righteous before him, you will see those tremendous fruits come forth. Look at the scripture in Matthew. One thing's for sure, you need to put the word first place in your life and not compromise it for anybody. Matthew 10, 34. They all thought that Jesus was going to come to bring peace. Well, he did say peace for all men, but look what he says here. Think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. What's a sword do? A sword divides, doesn't it? I'm come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Does God want separation and division? No, he wants everybody to come in line with his ways, but why would this be? Because one is following the Lord and one is not following the Lord. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. Can you compromise the word of God in your household? No. You've got to put the word first place. You want to see everybody walk in it, so you're all in one accord. But if they won't, your foes could even be in your own household. You cannot compromise the word. We see too many Christians that have compromised the word. They have all kinds of problems going on in their life. They wonder why they're not seeing blessing. They wonder why their children are problems or their marriage isn't right or they're not seeing the prosperity and blessing. Well, we cannot compromise the Word of God at all. We've got to make sure we're following the way of the Lord and putting Him first place in our life, which is absolutely essential, which means you're going to walk this way of the Lord. Luke chapter 1, verse 78. And nine. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us. Who's the day spring? Jesus. He's come and visited us. To do what? To give light to them that sit in darkness, so we're not going to be in darkness any longer, in the shadow of, and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. There's a way of peace. He's going to guide your feet into the way of peace. That's through the Word in you. In fact, that's part of what the armor of God is on in your life. Remember what it says over in Ephesians chapter 6? Ephesians chapter 6. We come down here. Verse 15, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You're going to walk after the Word that produces the peace. And the preparation is an internal preparation. You've got to get prepared within. Prepared and ready to walk in line with the Word. Well, that means you can't well, just be blindsided by all these things. If you're prepared and ready, you're going to be ready for anything that comes at you. You should be ready always to walk in line with the Word, to conquer any temptations, to do what the Word says in every situation. This is why we've got to get internally prepared. Many people don't get prepared and they're, they're not going to walk in the ways of the Lord if you're not. Your feet are to walk in the way of peace. It's a way that will lead you step by step to get to that place. This is also why you've got to really guard your heart. <coughs> in John, chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. This is when he's getting ready to go to, back to heaven. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. It's not a worldly peace, not a peace that anybody out in the world has. It's God's peace. It's a spiritual peace. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That means you've got to guard your heart. We can't let ourselves get troubled on the inside of us. We can't let ourselves get into fear. 
This is going to, of course, take the peace of God away from you because you're giving place to the enemy on the inside of you. He wants you to understand that you are going to walk in His ways and you are going to have the peace that passes all understanding to guard your heart and mind. This is why you got to guard yourself. This brings us over to Philippians. Philippians. Chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing. The word careful is the word marimnao, which means to be anxious. We're not supposed to be anxious about anything. No anxiety. You don't be anxious about what's going on in the world. You need to keep your eyes on the Lord and walk in His ways. You can't be anxious for anything. I mean, everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests or your legal demands be made known unto God. And what's going to happen when you pray the word? The peace of God, which passes all minds. This is the word noose, meaning mind. Shall guard. This is the word phroeo in the Greek, which means to guard, like a military guard. Guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You've got to be guarded. Are you going to have peace if you let the devil continually get to your mind and get to your heart? No. You've got to guard your heart. You've got to guard your mind. Remember, the word's written in two places. It's written in your heart and it's written in your mind. You need to have the word in you and you need to have it guarded. The peace of God will guard your heart and mind. If you lose your peace within, that means you've given place to the enemy somehow. You've let him ha have opportunity to come into you. God doesn't want that. He wants you to be anxious for nothing. No anxiety, no turmoil whatsoever. Not be troubled, not be fearful, not be agitated. Do you get agitated over things? you got a problem. He didn't want you to get agitated over things. He wants you to have the peace of God. You're going to be led forth with joy and go, go forth with joy and led forth with peace in every place that you go. And remember, what's going to be a key? It's where your mind is set. So if you are going to obtain this peace, you've got to govern your mind with the Word. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, in line with the truth, whatsoever things are honest, this is honorable before God, whatsoever things are just or righteous, whatsoever things are pure and clean and holy, things that are lovely, this means acceptable and well-pleasing. It means you just don't let anything come into your mind. You've got to jump on that and cast that down. If you're not governing your mind, you're going to give place to the enemy left and right. He goes on and says, whatever things are of a good report, not all this negativism. If there be any virtue, moral excellence, if there be any praise, think on these things. God wants you thinking on good things. And also, all the things you've learned, you're expected to take hold of them and have them applied in your life for your lifestyle. How many things have you learned that you haven't applied and put it in your lifestyle? We should be taking hold of everything. Look what he says here. If you want to see the God of peace be with you and manifest the covenant of peace in your life, these things which you both learned, whatever you've learned, and received, this is a word paralambano, which means you've taken with yourself or you've taken and joined it to yourself, you've taken it into you, meaning... It became your lifestyle. You incorporated it into your lifestyle. And heard and seen in me, do it. Be a doer. And this word is not the normal word poeo for doing. This is the word proso. This particular word means to be exercised, practice, busy with, carry on, to accomplish and perform this in your life. Otherwise, he expects you to incorporate this into your lifestyle, everything that you're hearing. We're not supposed to be forgetful hearers. We're to be doers of the word we hear. Why would you be a doer of the word you hear? Because you take hold of it, you put it in operation, it is your lifestyle. And this is present tense, meaning ongoing, continuous action. So he's saying, all the things you've learned, received, heard, and seen in me, be doing it, practicing it, accomplishing it, performing it continually. What's that going to do? That's going to bring you to the place of walking in the Word all the time in everything. People say, boy, this just sounds almost overwhelming. 
Well, if you haven't been taught that you're to be a hearer and a doer of the word, it might be overwhelming to you, but that's not what God thinks. God expects us to have learned his word, take hold of it, do it, and put it into our lifestyle. You're to become like Jesus. You're to have the mind of Christ. How do you get the mind of Christ? Because your mind gets renewed to it and you're thinking on what he wants all the time. This is what he has for us. And then notice what he says, and the God of peace shall be with you. That's right. And when he's with you, you are going to see victory come forth. You also must understand when you're being led by the Lord, he is always going to give you a piece of what is right. Peace is the mark of the leading of God in your life. Colossians 3, 15, look what it says. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. It's interesting. I put the cursor over the word rule. Look what it says. It's the word brobuo, which means to be an umpire. What does an umpire do? He settles disputes about something. What's right and what's wrong? The peace of God will be like an umpire in your heart to show you what's right, what's wrong, what he wants you to do, what he wouldn't want you to do. If you don't have peace before you make decisions and you do things, you're making a mistake. Are you doing it just because you want to do it? Are you doing it just because it's your desire without even seeking after the Lord? That's why people have made so many mistakes. They did things in their own strength, their own desires, and they wonder why it didn't pan out. It was no destruction. It didn't, didn't produce any fruit. It was the wrong choice. No. The peace of God is to be the umpire in your heart, to show you what to do on every situation. He will give you a peace on the inside of you. We also see that if you're going to have the peace of God, you've got to take a stand for righteousness, and you can't be compromised in it because of what people do or don't do. 2 Thessalonians 3, 13 and following. Brethren, be not weary in well-doing. You keep doing what's right. You always be a doer of the word of God. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Otherwise, do, am I going to have fellowship with people that aren't going to walk in line with the word? No. I'm going to be there to minister to them, encourage them, but that's not who I'm going to be in fellowship with, that's for sure. You have no company with them. No company means you're not going to be mixing with them. You're not going to be budding around with them. No. You're not supposed to have anything to do with them. You don't count them as an enemy, but you admonish them as a brother. And then he says, now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. Because can you be in fellowship with someone that's not walking right? No. Evil companionships will corrupt good manners. You'll get corrupted by the wrong people that you're around, that you're in fellowship with. God wants you to have peace at all times. Well, you're not going to have peace when you're around a bunch of turmoil. You don't want to be all around those kind of things. You want to make sure you're walking in line with the Word. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts and follow. This is a Greek word, dioko. It's not the normal word for follow. It's a word which means to run after something. You're running after righteousness, faith, Charity, which is love, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. God wants you running after these things. I mean, that's, lot, lot, that's not like just, you know, wandering around, meandering around, and maybe if you find, run in contact with this, great. No. You're running after it. It's a priority in your life. I want to know righteousness. I want to know faith. I want to be in faith. I want love. I want peace. I want all these things that God has for me. I'm going to run after them. Oh, that's diligent effort, isn't it? That's you pursuing these things. That means it's going to be a priority in your life. Many people have not set priorities. No wonder they don't see peace, prosperity, blessing, safety, protection, and all these things. These promises only come when you meet the conditions in your life. That is what God expects. And He wants you to walk after His laws. Look what it says over in Galatians chapter 6. Verse 16. 16. 
as many as walk according to this rule, which would be the word of God, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Who's the Israel of God? It's the church. Now, remember, one is a Jew now, not one outwardly, but one inwardly on the inside of us, because we now have been brought into relationship with God. The two, the broken wall, middle wall partition has been broken down. The two now become one new man, one new creation. And so now you and I are to walk, and it's interesting, this word walk, it's not, again, the normal word walk, which is peripateo. This is the word stokeo. This is a different word. It means to proceed in a row as the march of a soldier and go in order. That means God wants you to walk orderly. How do we walk in order? How do we walk like a soldier in, mar in line with what we should be doing? You follow orders. You go in order. According to this rule, that's the guy that's going to be peace on him. That means... You're submitted to the Word of God to follow His commandments. You put His Word first place. Many people don't want to put the Word first place. They don't even want to hear the Word. They just want to walk on their own ways. And then when they have a problem, they want to run to God and think He's going to manifest all these great things for them. Now, it's not going to happen. You're going to have to plant the seed. The seed's got to grow before it produces the fruit, doesn't it? He wants you to walk in the ways of the Lord. It's a walk, isn't it? How you're proceeding consistently. That is what he's looking for in every single person's life. Another thing that's important for you to see the peace of God is receiving correction. This is another major problem in the body of Christ. Many people are not correctable. You tell them something and they just kind of ignore it. I've seen it for years and years and years. If they put the word first place, they should take hold of it and be a doer of it and start seeing the fruit. Look what it says. Hebrews 12, 11. Now, no chasing, chastening for the present seems to be joyous. Oh, it doesn't give you joy when you're corrected, when you've been off track, does it? No. But grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness... Instead of you walking in unrighteousness, now you're going to start walking in righteousness and you're going to see the peaceable fruit of righteousness to who? Unto them that are exercised thereby. These are the ones that they now are exercising vigorously. This means, otherwise, hey, they're, they're receiving the correction. They're correcting things. They're getting things in order. I'm going to make sure I'm walking the right path and I'm not going to make those mistakes anymore. Many people won't receive correction that way. If you really receive correction correctly, you take hold of it, you get the word in you, and you're diligent to put it in operation and make sure you're not going to yield to that sin or that attack from the devil again in your life. That's what he wants. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down and feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet. That's necessary. You've got to walk the straight, narrow path. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. And follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. He wants you to follow peace with every person at all times in your life. Well, if we're going to be following the way of peace, that means we can't be getting in strife. If you're getting in strife, there is a problem. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who's a wise man and endued with knowledge? The word endued with knowledge is a word which means the guy who has got experience of it in it to the point where it says one having the knowledge of an expert. God wants you to become an expert in everything of the Word of God. Not just to know a few facts and then never see it working in your life. As you do the Word, God works it in you and you walk according to it. That knowledge will produce the fruit in your life. Who's a wise man and he's endued with this knowledge of an expert by the experience of hearing and doing the word? Let him show a good manner of life in his works with meekness of wisdom. How does God know us all? By our works. He knows you. That's by your works, by your fruit, by the things you do on a consistent basis. The priorities are shown in your life, of course, that are, that are a key, showing where, you, where you're following. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, 
glory not and lie not against the truth. Envying and strife? You get into arguments? You get into all contentious things? No. This wisdom descends not from above. It's earthly, sensual, and of the devil. And where envying and strife is, there is confusion. You know what that means? Instability. You see, a lot of Christians, well, they may not want to admit it, but it's the truth. If you get into envy and you get into strife and you get into arguments, you get into contention and these things, you're an, instabi you're an instability, a state of disorder, disturbance. We're spiritually unstable. We, can't, we don't want to be that way. And every evil work means the devil can work whatever he wants. He'll bring all kinds of destruction at you. We're not supposed to have any envy and strife whatsoever. We're supposed to walk in the ways of the Lord. You shouldn't be angry. You shouldn't be getting in strife. You shouldn't be in arguments. You shouldn't be getting contentious. The guy who's contentious and doesn't do the truth, he's end up, he's in trouble. We saw that in Romans chapter 2 today. For those of you who didn't see it, unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth. What happens to them? But obey unrighteousness because they're not doing the word. They get indignation, they get wrath, they get tribulation, and they get anguish. All kinds of problems. This should not be going on in our life. We should be walking in love at all times, not in any kind of strife or any bitterness or envy or any of these things. You also have to watch that you don't get bitter. You've got to put away all these areas. Put away all the areas of sin if you're going to have the peace of God in your life. They're just traps that the devil sets you up for, and if you fall into them, he can, he can do all kinds of destructive things. Confusion and every evil work will manifest. Look what it says over here in Isaiah 38, 15. What shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me, and himself hath done it. I will go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. I've seen lots of people that have bitterness, and they never let go of it. They can't get over it for some reason because they don't make the right choices of the Word of God. The bitterness of my soul, and I'm just going to go, I'm just going to have this all my life, essentially is what he's saying. Hey, if you have bitterness, you've got to get rid of it. You've got to root this thing out, and it's going to be dealing with your sin. Look what he says. Verse 17, for peace, I had great bitterness. you got bitterness, you don't have peace. You'll have all kinds of turmoil. How did he get rid of this bitterness? For thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Bitterness is because of your sins, not because of what someone did to you. It's your reaction to what they did to you. You're bitter because of someone did a terrible thing to you. You've got to forgive. If you won't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven of your own sins. You've got to put, put the Word of God first place and walk in it and live above reproach and not let the enemy have place in your life. All the sins they dealt with, you're going to get rid of that bitterness and you're going to come to the place of abiding in peace as your soul is getting restored. That's what he wants for every single one of us. We see a scripture over in 2 Peter. Chapter 3. If you're going to obtain peace, you're going to come to the place of holiness and walking uprightly before Him. 2 Peter 3.11 says, Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. What's he talking about? He's talking about when the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise, the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat, the earth also and the works, they're going to be burned up. New heavens and new earth, this is all going to be gone after the millennial reign of Jesus. Seeing then you see all these things to be dissolved, what manner of persons must, this says ought, but it's the word die, which means necessary, and it's a word that's translated must 58 times of the 106 uses. It really means must. What manner of persons must you be in all holy Manner of life, conduct, and behavior. If we're not walking in holiness, if we don't have a holy manner of life, conduct, and behavior, we haven't met the conditions for this. And godliness, 
walking in obedience to God's word. He goes on, he says, looking for and hasting to the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire will be dissolved, the elements shall melt, melt with fervent heat. That's going to happen. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. And what, who's going to be there? Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Only the righteous are going to be there. Only those who are walking in righteousness that have the fruits of righteousness. Who's going to produce that in you? The Lord does. How? By your obedience to the word of God. Not in yourself. Remember, we'll come back to this in a minute. What produces righteousness? It's very clear. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Know you not to whom, that's a spiritual authority, a person, you yield yourselves servants to obey, whoever you're obeying. His servants you are to whom you obey. Whether of sin, well, what are we yielding to if we're yielding to sin? We're yielding to the devil. It produces death. Or of obedience. Obedience to what? To the Word of God. What does that produce? Righteousness. And the measure that you're obedient is the measure that you have righteousness, fruits of righteousness in your life. That's why obedience is mandatory. That's why he said work out your own salvation by being always obedient in all things. That's what he expects for every single one of us. We go back to 2 Peter chapter 3. And we, where he says, see in verse 13, where dwelleth righteousness, wherefore, beloved, seeing you look for such things, which we are, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace. That means we're not going to have any unforgiveness, we're going to have resentments, we're not going to have bitterness, we're not going to have hatred, we're not going to have all this turmoil, we're not going to have all this anxiety, we're not going to have anything that's, you know, causing all kinds of problems in our soul, our heart, our mind, without spot. That's spotless, blameless. That's what God wants. We're to come to the place of being blameless, without spot. What kind of church is Jesus going to present to himself? Just whoever's around and been born, you know, signed on the dotted line kind of attitude and got born again? No. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's see what kind of church he's going to present to himself. That he might present to himself a glorious church. What kind of church is a glorious church? Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what God wants. And how's it going to happen? He's going to do this work in you to bring you to the place of being holy. And without blemish. And this is because of his covenant work in your life. Back to other scriptures that we'll look real quick. Or Hebrews first. We saw this this morning. you got to let God have his way in your life. You can't be doing your own thing. You're supposed to deny yourself and crucify the flesh daily. That's the first step out of the box, you know. If you don't do that, you're not going to get anywhere. Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. You're going to be a doer of the word. And God's going to make you perfect. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Who accomplishes it? The Lord does. How? Because you're going to be doing His will. What's His will? His word. As you're doing the word, He'll be working in you the things that are well-pleasing in His sight. And you've got to understand, what's He going to accomplish? 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5, verse 23. The very God of peace sanctify you holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. He wants you to be sanctified, holy, consecrated, dedicated, separated, purified, cleansed, holy before him. I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved, blameless. This is the blameless, without blame, unto the coming. This is the parousia, which is the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We're to live holy. We are to live blameless. We're to live without spot. That's why you've got to crucify the flesh. You know, he talks about hating the garment spotted by the flesh. Yeah, you can't have your garment spotted by the flesh. You've got to make sure you're walking in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the loss of the flesh. And notice, in order to see this be accomplished, who's going to do it? God's going to do it. Faithful is he that calleth you. Who is calling you? He's calling you to be holy. He's calling you to be without spot, without blemish, unrebukable, unreprovable, who also will do it. God's going to do it. You can't do it. God's going to do it. But how does God do anything? Well, you doing the Word. If you don't do the Word, is He going to get it done? No. You see, you're in a covenant relationship. And the covenant relationship is one party has his responsibilities, and the other party has his responsibilities. All that the Word tells you that you're to do is your responsibility. You do that, and then God will perform all of His promises and bring everything to pass in your life. And you're going to see the God of peace manifest Himself in your life to bring you to the place of completeness, perfection, wholeness, healed, delivered, prosperous, blessed, showers of blessings coming on you, the sanctuary of God, knowing Him, Him manifesting in your life, bringing forth everything that He purposes in you. He's faithful. He's calling you. He'll do it. You just got to put him first place in all that you do and understand you got a covenant of peace and it's only going to be manifested if you meet the conditions. You do it, God will bring it to pass for you. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of how the peace of God is obtained and manifest in my life. As I put the word first place, as I walk in the word, keep the commandments, do the word of God, cast out all the devils, walk uprightly before him with a perfect heart, do all that he commands with humility, go on to perfection, have uprightness of heart, walking in righteousness with fruits of righteousness, loving your word, not forgetting it because of being a doer of it consistently, not just a hearer only, getting, walking after knowledge, getting understanding, getting wisdom, my ways pleasing the Lord so the enemies are at peace with me. I'll be in spiritual rest as my mind is stayed on you. You'll keep me in perfect peace. As I hearken to your commandments, peace will be like a river flowing in my life and righteousness as the waves of the sea. As I am walking in your ways, righteousness, doing that word, I'll be a fruitful field. And the work of righteousness and the action of righteousness produces quietness, Rest, assurance, total victory, a fruitful field, peaceable habitations, total rest and victory. I thank you that I am going to be led forth with peace as I walk in line with the Word. I will never allow myself to get into unforgiveness, bitterness, resentments, negative attitudes, strife, Arguments, holding grudges, negative attitudes against anybody. I will always operate in love. I will not give place to anything that the enemy would bring against me. I will walk in the fear of the Lord. Truth will be in my mouth. No iniquity in my lips. I am going to walk worthy of the Lord in obedience to Him. In the way of peace, I will not let my heart be troubled. I will not fear. I will not be anxious. I will not give place to the attacks of the enemy. My mind will be stayed on the Lord. As I have a mindset after the things of the Spirit, I'll have the spiritual mind that produces life and peace. 
I thank you, Lord. I'm putting on the armor of God, the word in me, so I'm internally prepared for every situation. What I've learned and I receive and take hold of, hear and see, I will be doing it, practicing it, seeing it manifest as a lifestyle in me. And then the God of peace will manifest himself to me. I thank you, Lord. I will receive your correction. And it will produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness as I am a doer of it. And I receive the correction and make the changes in my life. I thank you that I will be found without spot, blameless under the coming of the Lord. And I will see your sanctifying work that I will be preserved blameless under the coming of Jesus Christ. I thank you. You are faithful who has called me and you will do it. If I will be obedient, put the word of God first place, I will see the covenant of peace come into manifestation and I will become like Jesus and I will see all of your blessings, showers of blessings, coming upon me in my life. I don't want a trickle once in a while. I want the showers of blessings. And it will happen if I walk in line with your ways to see the covenant of peace manifest in my life. I thank you, Lord. I'm going to be a doer of your word and I am going to see the peace of God manifested in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You put the word first place. You just get your priorities in order. You get diligent. You be zealous. You do everything that God says. God is going to take note of that, and he is going to manifest himself mightily in your life. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We're going to be hearers and doers of this word. We will obtain the peace of God because we're going to meet your conditions. We'll have the fruits of righteousness. We'll be conquering every enemy. We will not give place to any sin. And we will be come to the place of seeing you manifest the covenant of peace in our life because we hear and do this word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God.